Hello, my name is Sonali Beswas, and I am one of the Duke School of Medicine students who will be leading the training today for Stop the Bleed, a course from the American College of Surgeons. Please take a moment now to scan the QR code on your screen to take our pre-test survey. Today, you are going to learn about the Stop the Bleed initiative and how you can stop the bleed and learn to save a life. Today we are teaching you about bleeding control techniques because the number one cause of preventable death after injury is bleeding. We have two goals for you for class today. The first is to learn how to identify and recognize life-threatening bleeding. And the second is how to take steps to stop the bleed, which will include pressure, packing, and tourniquets. So this is a question for you all. What are some scenarios you can think of where there could be life-threatening bleeding. Please pause the video here and talk about this question as a group. What sorts of places did you think about? Our group thought about five main locations in which bleeding emergencies could occur. So these injuries could occur at work. Um, things we think about would be construction sites, of which there are a lot around the dorm area, as well as agricultural work and factory work. Of course, car and motorcycle accidents is maybe something you thought about. Um, this is a big one. Things at home, for instance, as you see in that picture above, like, you know, knives in the kitchen. Um, gun violence, as well as unexpected events, such as that explosion, if you remember, that occurred in downtown Durham a couple years ago. So here's another question for you. What are the signs that bleeding is life-threatening? Again, please pause the video here for discussion. What are some of the things that you talked about that might be signs of life-threatening bleeding? Uh, things that we usually think of when we think about signs of life-threatening bleeding include blood is, that is spurting out of the wound, um, or blood that won't stop coming out of the wound. If you see blood pooling around the patient on the ground, if you see that someone's clothing or bandages is totally soaked through with blood, um, that's a very concerning sign. Of course, you know, things that are more extreme, like um, a patient has lost an arm or a leg, and then if a patient who is bleeding suddenly, you know, there's changes in their behavior or they become confused or unconscious, that's something else you're definitely going to be worried about. So one thing we really want to emphasize in this class is that your safety is your first priority. So if you get hurt, you're not going to be able to help other people. And now there's two people that's hurt. And it's kind of a worse situation than you started with. So we really only want you to help others when it is truly safe to do so. And, you know, some situations might start off safe and become unsafe. And if you find yourself in one of these situations, make sure to move to safety. Um, that's another priority. And if you can, you know, bring the, the patient or the victim with you. Uh, if possible, wearing gloves is, is obviously ideal. Um, if you get blood on you, uh, if you're wearing gloves, even if you're not wearing gloves, um, be sure to clean that body, body part really thoroughly. And then, of course, follow up with your healthcare provider and they'll see if any additional testing or interventions are needed. And so one of the major lessons we want you to take away from today's class are the ABCs of bleeding control. A is for alert 911, B is for bleeding, and C is for compression. And we'll talk about um, each of these facets in the coming slides. So A, A is for alert 911. If you find someone experiencing a bleeding emergency, the first thing you want to do after ensuring your own safety is to call 911. When you do so, it's really important to make sure that you know where you are and any other person in details. Um, and once you're on the phone, be prepared to follow the instructions provided by the 911 dispatcher. Next, B, uh, B is for bleeding. And so the next thing you wanna do after doing that uh, alerting 911 process is determine where the bleeding is coming from. So find the source. And just remember, people can be bleeding from multiple places at once and that clothing may hide life-threatening bleeding. And so although it might not seem like the supernatural thing to do, um, it really is important to, to remove clothing and that is an appropriate decision in these cases. And so there are three major categories of locations where bleeding emergencies can occur. So the first one we think about is arm and leg wounds. So the most frequent cause of preventable death from injury is due to bleeding from, from these type of wounds. You can see kind of in blue in the picture on the left. 
and we'll talk about these techniques um, in a few minutes, but how you control bleeding from arm and leg wounds is by applying direct pressure or by using a tourniquet. Next, the second category is called torso junctional wounds. So these are the green areas in the picture. So things like the neck, the armpit, and the groin. And so it's, it's kind of hard to get a tourniquet in there and we can, we can show why in uh, it's the coming slides. So in these areas, how you're going to control bleeding is by using direct pressure and by packing a wound. And then lastly, the last category of injuries are chest and abdominal injuries. So these can occur um, on the front, back, or the side of a person. But really, this type of bleeding can't really be controlled by the methods that we're going to talk about outside the hospital. A lot of times these people are bleeding on the inside and what they really need is to get quickly to a hospital that has the capability to take care of these type of severe injuries. So it's important again to alert 911 and ensure that EMS can get there as fast as possible and that's really the, the way you can be most helpful for patients with these type of injuries. And finally, C. C is for compression. We'll talk about three techniques, pressure, packing, and tourniquets in the coming slides. Next, we'll show a video scenario. While watching the video, be sure to look out for the things we have discussed. Also, be sure to note things that were done correctly and anything you notice that was done incorrectly. Lizzie and Julia are driving home from school when they notice a biker down on the side of the road who seems to be in pain. They stop their car and they quickly get out. Once they're out of the car, they check around them to make sure the scene is safe. They get to the biker and they realize things do not look good, so Julia tells Lizzie to call 911. Lizzie tells the police about where the person was injured, where they are, and any circumstances she knows. Meanwhile, Julia checks the wound that the biker points to. At this point, Julia sees a large quantity of blood but remembers her stop the bleed training applies a piece of cloth over the wound and applies pressure. She'll compress until someone comes for help. Pause the video now and discuss whether you think all of the ABCs were met by the actors in this scenario. Hopefully in your discussion, you found that all the ABCs were met in the way that these actors responded to this crisis. Here's another scenario similar to our first scenario, except this time, our students forgot some aspects of their Stop the Bleed training. Try and see if you can spot all the parts that they did a little bit differently. Two friends were on the way to the mall when they spotted a biker down on the side of the road. Once they reached her, they spent some time trying to wake her without much success. The biker started to seem more confused and dizzy. Julia told the other student to go call 911. Julia then spent some time checking the wound and found the source of bleeding on the leg. She rolled the leggings back down and began to apply pressure. She kept checking the wound to see if it stopped bleeding. Pause the video now and discuss whether you think all of the ABCs were met in the way that our actors responded to this crisis. Hopefully in your discussion, you found that our actors missed a few things in how they responded. For one, they did not stay calm when they saw that a biker was down on the side of the road. They approached the biker without checking the scene for safety. Instead of calling 911 right away, they spent a fair amount of time trying to wake the cyclist. They uncovered the source of bleeding, but they did not leave it uncovered when they went to apply pressure later on. Finally, Julia, one of our actors, did not hold constant pressure on the wound. Instead, she kept lifting her hands to check to see if the wound was still bleeding. For this next section, we'll be discussing compression. You can practice these skills at home by practicing compression on a pillow and practicing packing, which we'll talk about later, by using paper towels and scarves and an empty cardboard tube. Now we will discuss the details of different methods of compression, including pressure, packing, and using a tourniquet. First, we will discuss applying pressure. Applying direct pressure is the most effective way of stopping bleeding, and you will always have the supplies you need, your own two hands. 
pressure will stop the majority of bleeding. Don't be afraid to use your entire body weight. Effective pressure application may require a significant amount of force. Your hands should be clenched in the CPR position. You can also use towel, gauze, or other materials to help you apply pressure as well. Most importantly, don't release the pressure. It needs to be continuous. Releasing pressure to check on the wound may undo any bleeding control you've achieved. The second compression technique is wound packing. If bleeding is from a deep wound, superficial pressure may not work to control bleeding and you should attempt packing. You can use towels, rags, or any cloth available, including your own clothing. Remember, it is okay if they're dirty. You do not need clean materials to pack the wound. Packing all the way into the depths of the wound is important. You should use a systematic approach, like going clockwise or counterclockwise around the wound, to make sure you're packing all of the crevices. Once you complete packing the wound, be sure to hold pressure until help arrives. Here we see Julia packing the wound. Notice that she is using a systematic, clockwise approach to make sure she fills all the crevices of the wound. Once she has completely packed the wound, she returns to holding pressure using all of her body weight until help arrives. The final compression technique is using a tourniquet. Tourniquets should be considered for bleeding that does not stop with pressure or packing or if the situation does not allow you to maintain pressure on the wound. Tourniquets can be found in many first aid kits or bought individually. Tourniquets can be applied to others or on yourself. They can also be applied over clothing. It is important to remember that tourniquets hurt and they may cause significant pain to the person you're applying them to. If one tourniquet does not stop the bleeding, a second tourniquet may be applied However, it is important to note that this second tourniquet should be placed directly above the previous tourniquet. Now we will review the steps of applying a tourniquet. First, the tourniquet should be applied at least two to three inches above the wound. Remember, we're trying to stop blood flow to the wound, so the tourniquet should be placed between your heart and the wound. Next, you'll want to tighten the tourniquet as much as you can using the Velcro strap alone. Once the strap is secured, you should twist the windlass or this plastic rod after securing the Velcro. Once the Velcro is secured, you should twist the plastic rod or windlass until the tourniquet tightens to the point where skin is visibly indented. For a new tourniquet, this will be achieved after two to three rotations of the windlass. Once the windlass is tight, the windlass should be secured in place and most tourniquets will have an area to mark the time if you're able to remember it. Importantly, tourniquets can be left on for up to six to eight hours before they put a limb such as your leg or arm at risk of amputation. So you should never remove a tourniquet or loosen it once it has been put in place. Here we see Julia applying a tourniquet. She works to place the tourniquet above the wound. Watch as she measures the distance above the wound as two to three finger breaths are two to three inches. Next, she secures the Velcro strap and begins spinning the windlass. Once the windlass is tight, she secures it and then replaces the Velcro strap. In our last few slides, we'll cover a few additional topics related to stop the bleed. The first is bleeding control in children. In all but the extremely young child, the same tourniquet used for adults can be used in children. For the infant or the very small child, where a tourniquet might be too big, Direct pressure on the wound, as described previously, will work in almost all cases. For any large, deep wounds, wound packing can be performed in children just as in adults, using the same technique that we previously described. On this last slide, we'll cover a few frequently asked questions that we often get at the end of our trainings. 
The first is, what if the person you're helping has an impaled object, an object sticking out of them that's causing their wound or their bleeding? It is never recommended to remove this object in the field. So if you're helping with stop uh, with their bleeding control, it's important to apply tourniquets above the object and allow medical professionals to remove the object in a controlled environment such as a hospital or an operating room. Our training does not cover improvised tourniquets, so we recommend that you use whatever skills you're most confident in after this training, including compression and packing, in the event that a tourniquet is not available. Some are concerned about applying tourniquets leading to loss of limbs, like arms or legs. Recall that earlier we said that a tourniquet can be left on for six to eight hours before it causes any permanent limb damage. For this reason, we encourage you to use a tourniquet when it's available because it's likely that the person will be able to seek medical attention within that six to eight hour window. Next is pain. It's important to recognize that a lot of our compression techniques including uh, packing and applying a tourniquet, will cause the person a great deal of pain. For this reason, we recommend talking the person through your actions and making sure that they're aware of the fact that pain is likely. For this last bullet, we often get a question about what to do if you notice that the person you're helping has a loss of pulse. It's recommended that you continue with whatever stop the bleed efforts you've already initiated because you're still contributing to helping preserve that person's blood volume until help arrives. Here's a summary slide of what we've learned today. We've reviewed personal safety, the ABCs being alert 911, finding the source of bleeding, and compression with pressure and or packing or a tourniquet. And we've covered waiting for help to arrive. Thank you for joining us for this training today, and we hope it was helpful. Please use the QR code on the screen now to complete the post survey. Thank you.